Have you got some great songs but no one is listening? Are you struggling to find your audience? Worry no longer. Go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book and download a copy of the free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. It talks about growing your fan base, finding your niche and getting your music out there, the essential foundations you need and the steps to take to get your music heard. How to Get Your Music Heard. Get it now at musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book. It just came on and I was working right beside the stereo and I stopped and I was like, whoa, 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 what was that? Hold up, hold up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. Way back in 2004, I was a first year music student and I met a guy in my class who was a phenomenal drummer. We were fast friends due to our shared love of drums and he became a big inspiration to the way I approach my own playing. Although life saw us take different paths, I've periodically kept up with what he's up to and how his drumming has progressed. Over the years, this guy has played in some really great bands, has toured and recorded with some massive artists including Kimbra, Miami Horror and Echo Vandal. He's had sponsorships from the likes of Sonor, UFIP, Pearl, Remo and Zildjian and has become one of Instagram's most popular drummers. Oh, and he's a coffee roaster. This guy is Stan Bicknell and he's my guest this week. Stan talks about his early years on the drums, his practice routine and his dedication to his instrument. We also discuss sponsorships, social media and turning down the rockstar lifestyle. We caught up over a couple of beers at his coffee roastery, Rumble Coffee in Melbourne. I mean, I've always had like an inclination towards music from a real young age, just always got obsessed with certain songs and bands and whatnot. But um, I didn't actually start getting into music till I was 12. So my dad gave me a guitar and I played guitar for two years and that was pretty cool. And then during that time I was tapping a lot and my stepdad had suggested that maybe I look into the drums. I ended up at, at a friend's house one day and his brother had a kit and I had a turn on it. Initially, it didn't actually feel very natural. I didn't really like it. Mm. And so I kind of just put it into the background again. And then um, about six months later, I found myself at, in the same situation on that drum kit. And I sat down behind it and I played the classic boom, get, 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 boom, get. Like it just came out of me. And I just remember like a full sense of euphoria. I remember um, just thinking, oh yeah, okay, I actually get this now and I could do something with it. And then I just got obsessed, man. And I did all sorts of crazy stuff to, to get better. My mum was listening to a lot of... Um, self-help tapes at the time yeah like those guys with like tapes that you put on and you listen to it and it's almost like meditative you know yeah. and so i started recording into my cassette player how to play smells like teen spirit and so i'd like play the verse i'd play the actual song of the verse and then i'd like softly talk over it <laughs> and shit like that i'd say in the verse you're going to play the hi-hats <laughs> The bass drum yeah. and the snare. <laughs> and I used to go to sleep to this tape. It was both sides of this tape. And I don't know if it worked, but I figured out how to play the song. Yeah. But point being is that um, once I was in, I was in 150%. So I still play the guitar now, but it's the guitar just gives me something that the drums doesn't give, but it's not a focus. It's just sort of like a another way to express that side, you know? It's interesting that when you first sat down, you didn't think you had any natural ability. No, nah, it's funny because I remember sitting down behind the kit and just feeling like I was completely lost. I, I remember thinking, like, because I'd never sat down behind a kit before and as soon as I sat down, it was just too much. It felt noisy. I hadn't even started playing yet and it just felt very noisy. Yeah. There was so much in front of me and I was like, because I'd already started playing the guitar, um, I was like, this does not make any sense to me whatsoever. So, yeah, I suppose I just needed a bit more time. Because <laughs> I remember that feeling as well. But I also remember sitting down, My one of my first memories of drums is sitting down at the drums and the second thing that you described, kind of just going, doof, ke, doof, ke, and, and just going, being able to Whoa. play and going, hey, I can kind of just play that. Yeah. You and know. how good did it feel? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I guess it can be, you know, when you sit down and there's 10 different things to hit. Um, if you've never thought about it before. No, nah, and I only did it because my stepdad, um, he suggested it. And then I think it was more about, like what I've learned about myself is that things have to be on my terms. Yeah. And so it's kind of like this constant negotiation that I have with myself. Um, so in retrospect, it was probably because he suggested it. And then I sat down and I was like, no, this ain't for me. And then organically, being in that position six months later, my friend was out on the farm with his brother. They had to do some work and I was just sitting by the drum kit. And so I jumped on it and I played that beat. And it was on my terms. And then that mm. sense of euphoria hit me. 
And man, still to this day, like that was when I was 13 going on 14 and I'm 33 now. So this is like my 20th year on the kit. Mm. And I still have that sense of euphoria. Like there's been moments where it's come and gone. Yeah. But I know how to nurture it now and I know how to bring it back. And I know the place that drums has in my life so that I can foster that feeling because that's what I'm in it for, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I've learned as well, that through all the missioning, you know, all the dreams and the goals and all of that, that's actually what I'm in it for. I'm in it for that euphoria. It's that feeling. Yeah. But it just took me a long time to realize that because you go off track, you know, you become a creative person, you know, so I was into the drums or you were into the drums. And so you spend the next five or six or seven years getting really technically proficient, learning your instrument as good as you can because you want to become a professional. Mm. And then becoming a professional gets put in front of you, you know, whether, whether it be you're playing full-time in covers bands, whether you're teaching, whether you're touring, you know, and I've done bits of all of that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden that euphoria and that creativity starts to get sucked out a little bit, yeah. you know? And it's funny, like, I've sort of had this realization in the last couple of years in particular, just at how it's so ironic that we, this creative outlet that we chase hard to make our profession, once we finally do make it a profession, that whole euphoria and creative side of it just gets, gets completely withdrawn from it. Yeah. And then you spend the next yeah, yeah. 10 years trying to figure out how to bring it back. Yeah. Yeah, and there's I mean, a million different ways to skin the cat. So the way that I do it is that I just keep it, it's personal. My drumming is for me, yeah. you know, it's on my terms. I remember when I started studying music and I had a friend uh, that said to me, I could never do that because it would take the fun out of music for me. Yeah. Um, and I was like, nah, nah, you know, it's going to make it more fun. And it did in a lot of ways. But as you said, when I actually became a professional, it turns into a job. Yeah, exactly. And you do have to find ways to continue to want to do it yeah and there's that initial period where it is fun because everything's new for the first time yeah you know so whether it's sitting in a bus and touring around or taking flights and whatever different venues different countries blah 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 and then all of a sudden it becomes very normal and you're hurrying up to wait everywhere and you're not actually getting much time to play you know you're not mm. actually getting much time to practice you're going to rehearsals and then you're going to gigs and the way that i see it we're probably jumping well ahead but the way that i see it in terms of creativity is um like I've had to use this analogy a few times. I think everyone's got like this, like a pool of creativity that they have per week, right? And the pool is full of creativity. And if you're teaching and if you're gigging a lot and you're rehearsing a lot, you're slowly draining from that pool. Sure. And so you can get to the end of your week and you've done all the things that you are required to do. And then you sit down on the kit or sit down on your instrument or whatever the creative aspect is, like painting or whatever, and you're suddenly like, oh, I don't know what to do. It's because the pool's empty, man. Yeah. You drained it, you know? And yeah, so yeah. I've learned how to um, ride that balance of you've got to pull from it, you know, but I can't empty it because most the most important thing is that I have the outlet, you know? I mean, I still actively pursue drumming um, now just as hard as what I did between the years of 14 and 20 years old. I don't play as much as what I did then, but I'm still trying to get better as much as what I did then. You know, which says something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, a yeah. lot of the guys that I'm, a lot of my peers that I grew up with that play music and stuff, they may still play, but they definitely don't have that drive to get better like I do. And no. that's just an observation. That would describe me. You know, you get it to a certain level and you have that drive for, maybe, you know, your formative years, I guess. And then you reach a certain level and you kind of go, yeah, I can play the drums now. Yeah. I'm pretty good. Yeah. You know, and people go, hey, man, you were awesome last. And you go, yeah, oh, yeah. I was. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. And then, yeah. like, the, yeah, the, the drive to improve just sort of, and maybe it's still there a little you bit. You start to ride it. You start yeah. to ride your, you know, you rest on it, on yeah. your ability. Yeah. yeah. And if you keep, you know, you maintain that ability maybe, but you don't push harder to get to the next level. I exactly. Think maybe it's and then you get few. busy, you know, then you get busy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I had a conversation with my son the other day. Um, he's 13 going on 14. And I said to him, I was like, right, you've got some interest at the moment. You're into surfing, you're into basketball and you're into drumming. And he's into sports and stuff. And I said, you know, like being, being active. And I was like, great. I said, man, for the next six years, your life's sorted. You don't have to worry about food. You don't have to worry about rent. You don't have to worry about anything like that. Put the time in now. You're never going to get these hours back. This mm. amount of hours every single day between the age of 14 and 20, you're never going to get those two or three hours a day that you can put into something. No. And I said, we'll cover everything else, man. I, like if you've got, if you're interested in something, all you have to do now at this point is just do it a lot mm. and you will reap all the benefits, you know, and it's that whole thing because um, you don't ever get those hours back, but you can still maintain that euphoria or maintain that creative release you know and that's what i've sort of been more about these days in terms yeah. of um where i hold drumming now yeah mm. let's go back what was your first kit uh it was a century five piece a 499 dollars century five piece that i paid off it's brand new 
Um, yep, I paid it off on lay-by and it was, uh, it was mahogany, mahogany copper from memory. Yeah. And I looked after that kit better than any other kit that I've had since then and I've owned probably 13 or 14 kits in the last 20 years. And that kit, I mean, I used to take the lugs off every single screw. If there was a screw on it, once a week I'd pull it out, I'd, um, I'd completely disassemble the whole thing, I'd get mum's pledge and I'd shammy the whole thing down. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, eh? Yeah. Because I think about it now and I'm like, man, like... What and, kid does that? Uh, exactly. And I used to put music on and then I used to just get in the zone. And I still have elements of that. I mean, now you could probably consider it OCD or whatever, but it was just a real happy place, man. That's flow though, right? Yeah, it was that whole thing. Yeah, it was just like I did not ever mind putting that time in. And I would lose hours to doing stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And in my head, it would make the kit sound better because it was a piece of crap, bro. The symbols were like tin foil, and you know yeah, that yeah. whole thing. Yeah. But every time I cleaned it, it just felt like a, a million bucks. I remember the first time I got a, a really good symbol, and how like that initial feeling of playing a beat for the first time now happened when I got a proper symbol. Yeah. I got a Zildjian symbol, and I remember that just being like, in terms of what I was playing, these tin foil hats and a ride and a crash ride that you could like literally fold in half, and yeah. then getting an actual proper Zildjian symbol that was secondhand through the school that I was at. I was just like, whoa, you know, like once again, just completely got that whole euphoria <laughs> thing again. So, yeah. When I first met you, uh, actually, when I first saw you play the drums, which was before we met, you were playing at some long since closed bar in Hamilton yep. in a tool covers band. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Loot. That's it, loot. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember drunkenly standing at the front, just watching you um, <laughs> totally, totally focused because. I'm obviously, as you know, a massive Tool fanboy. Yeah, yeah. And I know all of their albums back to front, mm -hmm. note for note. Mm -hmm. And you did not miss a single. <laughs> I was sitting there just waiting for you to mess up. Well, I didn't. can tell you off the record <laughs> that I did mess up a lot because oh, really? I know the way that I played, that I interpreted those parts in yeah. hindsight. But, um, but that was that same thing, man. Like once I found Danny Carey, I got so fixated. Once I found Danny, there was only Danny, you know. And he, and he came into my life at the right time too because I was – I remember the first time that I heard Tool and um, initially it was The Grudge and I didn't like it. My yeah. friend showed me The Grudge off Lateralas and I was like, this is bullshit, man. And then one day I was uh, I was working at a trellis making factory out of the, um, on the outskirts of Taupo. We used to like plain wood and turn it into trellis. Yeah. And that same guy had on Anima and the track Eulogy and that 3-4 over 4-4 four, four groove that yeah. Danny plays, it just came on and I was working right beside the stereo and I stopped and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa what was that? Hold up, hold up. And I rewound it and I listened to it again. And I was like, I must've heard stuff like that before in terms of polyrhythms and whatnot. But mm. that was the first time that my brain was like, that is really fucking cool. And I need to know what's going on there and I need to know how to do it. And then yep. from that point onwards, I was probably, yeah, 16 going on 17, um, out of school and all that and doing the full-time work thing. And, um, I got absolutely obsessed with them. For mm. two years, man. Yeah. And so when I saw, like, the Tool Tribute ended when I was 19, I think, or 19 and a half going on 20. So the Tool Tribute didn't happen for, like, another year or two after discovering Tool, but got absolutely obsessed with him. I used to have my ride cymbal up high. I used to tune the <laughs> drums like him. I used yeah. to turn my snares off all the time. Um, and I used to listen to those albums. Like, man, I used to go to sleep to them. Just that OCD thing kicked in, hard yep. out. Yep. So much so that I spent years trying to get his playing out of my playing because he had influenced me so much sure. that when I started playing in my original band, the New Caledonia, like if I listen back on the, the demos of that now, it's like a cross between, it's like this ugly hybrid of Danny Carey merged with Carter Beaufort. Yeah. <laughs> like if you can imagine a love child of those two, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, That's a beautiful child nonetheless. That is, yeah, but real blatant references, you yeah. know? And so, and now I can say that he's just like, um, he's had a real good positive influence on my playing, but I've then moved on and turned it into something else. Mm. But man, that tool tribute was, that meant everything to me at the time. It was, a, it was so much fun. And what, um, what sort of rehearsal did you do for it? for it for those sort of years? So my friend and I, we, um, the first song that we learnt, who, who, who was the guitarist eventually for, for the tool tribute, um, we learnt eulogy. And the reason why is because our flatmate, our other flatmate at the time, in a drunken haze one night, told us that no one could play tool. Only tool could play tool. And we were like, fuck that guy. He was a bit of a dick anyway. <laughs> and so we like, we just went on a, you know, he and I connected hardcore musically. So we just went on a real fanatical, uh, we've got to nail this. We worked it out in sections. So he'd bugger off to his room for a while and learn the verse and I'd be working on it. And then we'd come together and collaborate on the first minute and a half. Mm. Um, some of the parts I didn't even know how to play and I didn't actually understand what he was doing. So I had to break down 
my parts even more so to learn the technique or whatever that he was doing. I was familiar with Double Kick at that point because I used to be a big Slipknot fan with their first album. That, that's what introduced me to Double Kick. So, um, but just it's purely just the polyrhythms and, and being able to hear fives and sevens the same way that you hear fours and play them with that sort of flow. Yeah. And then one night we showed Kane, our flatmate. He was just like, oh, yeah, it's all right. You know, the guy that was saying that it couldn't be done, we yeah. did it. And then um, and then we we did it at a friend's 30th party. We played um, maybe three or four Tool songs, so just the, you know, Stink Fist and all the classics, um, Eulogy and um, and a couple of others, and then had the idea of doing an actual tribute. And mm. then we had 12 songs by the end of it. Uh, as far as, like, your like rehearsal schedule, oh, yeah, when yeah. you were, you know, formative years, how mm-hmm. often were mm-hmm. you rehearsing and for how long? I'm self-taught. Yep. So I've had no formal training or anything on like that on the kit. Um, so all my teachers are the guys that I was inspired by. But I'd come home from school every day and, you know, play for an hour or two. Shout outs to mum and dad for, or mum and stepdad for putting up with all that. And then when it came, I, I don't know, like, I mean, I left home at 15 or 15 and a half, I left home. Yep. And so to think that I'd only been playing drums for a year and a half at that point and then still managed to keep pursuing it, man. I didn't even own a drum kit then. Mm. I was a snot-nosed kid in Hastings just causing all sorts of problems. And I was like couch surfing and, and whatnot. And I still managed to keep getting like, I don't even know how when I think <laughs> about it. It wasn't like I would still come across drum kits and I'd have a jam and I was constantly thinking about drums. And then it wasn't until I um, landed in Hamilton and lived with this guitarist from the Tool Tribute. They were a few years older than me. Um, they were all going to Polytech. I was 17 at the time. They were like sort of 20, 21. And I was living with, you know, guys that were studying music, that that was what they were doing. And yeah. they, they, to me, they seemed like adult, like, whoa, 21. That's crazy. Yeah, you know? yeah. and they, were, they were drinking and all that sort of stuff. And I'd been doing that sort of stuff with my peers, but I was doing it with the older guys now. Mm. And these guys would have parties and they'd like turn all the gear on and they'd smash out a few covers and like, you know, and I was just, it was just blowing my mind how awesome it was. And that's when the Hamilton scene was really cranking too. Mm. And when I turned 18, I went on the dole for yeah. a year. I'd left home when I was 15. I've been working since I was 11 and I was like, look, I just need a bit of me time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't need much to survive at that point, just the bare basics of what any 18-year-old would need to survive. And so I remember um, I found a sheet that had um, eight standard rudiments on, so just basically variations of the paradiddle and it had um, double strokes and single strokes and stuff. And I just made myself sit down every single day for pretty much, I would say, at least eight months. And I do that for two or three hours a day with my hands on my feet. That's that whole Virgil Donati, Donati yep. thing, you know. Yep. Um, I'd heard that. The guys that I was hanging around with at the time, they would tell these sort of stories of guys like that that, would, that were doing these insane hours to practice and whatnot. And I had the time. And then, yeah, I just, that OCD thing kicked in again. And, um, yeah, so I'd play pretty much two to three hours every single day. And I'd divide it, those eight, those eight rudiments, um, between my hands and my feet and I'd spend X amount of time on them and I, I had a system mm. and I don't know why. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. I didn't have a girlfriend for that year. I like, I don't know, I look back on it and I'm like, I'm stoked that I was so motivated to get so fixated on things because that period then has definitely given me the freedom and dexterity that I have now on the kit. Yeah. You know, and that's why I'm emphasizing to my son. I'm like, man, I've got your rent covered. I've got your food covered. Just practice. You know, I don't care what it is, even if it's like, well, I don't give a shit what it is, man. Just do lots of it yeah. and you will reap all the benefits. Yeah. And that's all it is, man. It's time plus effort equals results, which is something that I say a lot these days. But I don't know. I just that I just put in a lot of time and I was just happy to. I was just happy to chill out on my own. Yeah. You know, as you said, you reap the rewards. Yeah. That period must have just transformed you totally as yeah. a drummer. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there's got to be only a couple of 1% of drummers that or musicians that even get that and that actually can stick like most musicians I know, from, yeah. there's, there's no way that anyone's you know ever practiced that much um, yeah i suppose so eh? i mean to me it just made sense I, th- I think it was i was definitely in an inspirational environment these guys were all full-time at the, the degree before you and i went on to do it yeah. and they were learning heaps of cool things and uh, like and i was young and they they saw me as this young great drummer you know and it was kind of me living up to those expectations as well by the older guys and just knowing that i mean i always knew that all you had to do was do something a lot to get good at it yep. i don't know where that came from my old man's you know he's a, he's a pretty hard worker and so is my mum so maybe it came from them but um, I'm so stoked that I put that time in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it definitely helped. There's a practicality to it. I was never told that sort of thing. I was always told, um, you know, you can be what you want, put your heart into it and follow your dreams and it will happen kind yeah. of thing. But no one ever said, 
Yeah, well, but you have to literally practice every every single day. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah <laughs> no exactly. one said that part yeah, to me. Where's that know? part? Eh? Yeah, but I've thought about this a lot, man. And um, because you know, like I did leave home at fifteen, and um, and I was you know flatting from that point onwards, and basically just being a nuisance. But my drums just always keep me anchored, man. And I've only realised, especially in the last maybe year or so, that I don't play because I love playing. I play because I have to play. Like it's, I, I reckon that I've used it as a coping mechanism. Yeah. I, I, I reckon that it hit me uh, that I found drums at a really formative time in my life between 13 and 14. And I remember some stuff going on with the family at that time that was pretty heavy. And I think that I just um, totally identified with that um, subconsciously as being in my anchor. And if I look at the time that I got really obsessive with the drums, there was also some other big shit going on at the time too. Sure. And yeah. I, I definitely think, and even up until like through all the chaos that, that life throws at you, I've always used drumming as my anchor. Mm. It's, it's the way that I've identified myself. It's the way that I've, um, you know, um, got release out and um, definitely expression and creativity and all those things. But um, yeah, I definitely think that it's been my my pillar. Yeah. Yeah. How did you change your drumming voice from mimicking your inspirations? Um, you know, Danny, Joey, um, as a young drummer, mm -hmm. you talked before about how you had to shed a bit of that. Uh, and kind of find your own voice. Mm. How do you think you achieved that? Well, the band that I played with after um, the Tall Tribute Band, um, I moved on to that band, the New Caledonia, because my friend who was playing guitar on the Tall Tribute, he left and I needed to find a new guitarist and I found a guy who was recommended to me. His name's Mike McKenzie. And his friend, Tymon Martin, would come up and help Mike learn the parts for the Tall Tribute. And then Tymon, basically, after a few practices of helping his friend learn the parts, came over to me and said, man, um, you're a great drummer. I've got this band on the go. I've got some demos. We'd love to have a jam with you. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Up until then, I hadn't really done original bands. I'd only ever done covers and just playing, you know, Tool and whatever. And then, yeah, I started jamming with these guys and they had this whole different thing that I'd never heard before. And they had programmed drums underneath their parts of what they expected and what were, the, I suppose, like an idea of the groove and whatnot. And I instantly identified with it. And mm. then, I suppose, an answer to your question, it was from jamming with people that pulled that out of me. Sure. So I just happened to stumble across after the Tool Tribute a group of guys that musically needed something that I had because they couldn't find it from anyone else and musically had something that I needed to go to the next level, but I just didn't know it. These guys were inspired by the Mars Folder, uh, Mr. Bungle, you know, all, all, the, all those sort of prog instrumental bands of that era yeah. um, and then before and after as well. I hadn't really listened to a lot of that stuff. I, I always say I'm from like a groove rock era. Mm. I always listened to groove rock, you know, like so the... I'm in this weird area where the guys that I hung out with musically were a bit older than me. No one really listened to the music that I listened to. So I listened to like Corn and Limp Bizkit and Deftones and like all that sort of stuff and Rage Against the Machine. And it's groove rock, you know? Yeah. It's groovy, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I've learned and I've, I've thought about this stuff a lot too. And in retrospect, it's like those guys are really influenced by hip hop drumming. So John Otto and Abe Cunningham, I mean, and Brad Wilk from Rage, they cite hip hop. Yep. is like their influence yep. but then they were drummers as well and they were playing in like rock bands essentially or new metal bands and so um, it's kind of funny now man because I am really into like hip hop and, and that sort of stuff and it's it's amazing how much I identify with that sound now because I'm from that sort of groove rock era of guys who were also influenced by that 20 yeah. years ago you know so I'd never listened to the music that was coming to be with the New Caledonia and it just, it was the right, it was timing, man. It was just timing. Mm. My mind was ready to soak it in. I was ready to, to explore. And so what we used to do is go up into our rehearsal room and they would have a riff and I, we would just be lost for hours, man. Yep. And, and that's how, like the New Caledonia over, only ever released one album called Lotus and that album took two years to conceive and yeah. it is a, it's like every song has potentially 50 songs in it. You know, because the rule with that band was that there were no rules. And so it was like section, 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 odd time, odd time, odd time. And I don't count anything as well. So I feel it and then I make sense of it. Like I'm not like, a, oh, yeah, that's seven. And then he's adding one there and whatnot. So for me, it's like I've got to feel the flow of it. And so, yeah, it just forced me to get competent. I don't want to say good because I think that's a little bit self-indulgent. But it forced me to – like those guys expected a lot from me and they demanded a lot out of my playing. I'd done a lot of technical work in my own time and it was ready to be put to something and that's yeah. what the New Caledonia was. Now, interesting that you say you don't count. Does that is that still the is that still oh yeah the way? totally yeah nah um, I can count because I've had to ask I've had to count the New Caledonia when people have asked me what times and it just certain parts are in yeah but yeah I don't know I've never identified with music that way um, I don't want to get too heady about it you know I can read notation but I don't oh, I couldn't read it to like you know 
Um, I wouldn't put my life on it, yep. but I could butcher my way through it. Yep. But um, I'm definitely, it's that, you know, you're talking about feelings and all that and being connected. I'm the same. Like when I get given a riff, I want to see where organically I feel things should sit. If my friends have an idea or something, I don't generally want to hear it against a beat that they're programmed. You know, back in the early days with the New Caledonia, it definitely helped a lot. But now I want to hear how I interpret it and see sure. where that goes, you know? Sure. Unless I'm lost and I'm like, dude, give me the one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least. Yeah, but I guess that opens you up to a whole different world of uh, creativity because you're you're going, okay, well, that isn't, I'm not going to count that in 13. I'm going to count it in four. Yeah, you know? or just and not even, yeah, exactly. I'm just going to play because what I would do with the new cow, time and the guitarist would, um, if something was in 13, it, like that was sort of neither here or there, I would just listen to where his accents were sure. and I tend to place the bass drum and the snare around his accents. And so I'll be like, okay, boom, ga, boom, ga, boom, da, da, dun, da, dun. Yeah. You can dress that up a thousand ways, you know. Yep. So, uh, And then we used to just go and go and go and go. It was, it was a lot of fun. And um, you have had various sponsorships. Yeah. How did, can you talk about that, how that came, sort of came about? I suppose my, my first exposure to sponsorship started after the New Caledonia. Um, the boys moved over to Melbourne and at the time I, um, I had a young boy and I didn't want to move. So we parted ways and then 48 May knocked on my door. Mm-hmm. And so their drummer was moving on and they'd heard that I was uh, single now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was like musically it was a massive change for me, but it was um, the right time as well. They had backing tracks and they played to clicks and it was like a whole different thing, whereas the New Caledonia was freeform, no click, you know, you just go. And so I was pretty excited about the change and they were, they were reasonably big at the time as well. But with that came some endorsement deals with clothing companies and things like that. So mm-hmm. that was the start of all that. In terms of drum companies though, um, that was once I got here to Melbourne, I was playing for Kimbra. We had known Kimbra back in New Zealand. She used to come to the New Caledonia shows. And then mm-hmm. when she moved here, when she got her first deal, she needed a band. And um, the New Caledonia re-established in Melbourne wasn't really working too well. This, this city has a tendency to eat up bands yeah. and come here to chase the dream. Um, and so we basically became her backing band. And then the new cow fizzled out. And then with that, she was getting bigger. You know, there's a lot of hype and stuff. And uh, I was playing Sonor Kit at the time. And yeah, and I ended up meeting the artist relations manager for Sonor. And they signed me on as an artist. And with that, they were also bringing in UFIP symbols. Yep. And so they said, would you be interested in UFIP and Silver Fox Sticks? And I was like, yeah, shit, this all sounds great. I was yeah. like 22. <laughs> yeah. And like endorsement just means you get... Discounted rates. Yep. So, you know, I was getting, what I suppose, what would be wholesale or something like that. But at that time, you know, there was no no social media like there is now. So endorsements still had a lot of clout. So mm. I loved it, even just saying it, you know. Yeah. Um, and then while I was playing with Kimbra, or a little bit after actually, uh, I, I continued playing Sonor for a while and I just fell out of love with the brand. They started changing their models and stuff and I realized that their series of drums, I was more in love with the previous versions of yep. and the new stuff that was coming out, which I was expected to play, wasn't really tickling my fancy. So um, happened to meet the Pearl Zildjian artist and they also bring in Zildjian. Actually, I moved to Zildjian first from UFIP and while I was with Sonor still, just because that, there was an opportunity to do that and I'd always played Zildjian mm. and it's, there's a lot that comes with playing with that brand, you know, you'll know. I mean, you played Zildjian, yeah? My whole life. Yeah, exactly. So that was pretty cool um, and they were really happy to have me on board um, due to the success of Kimbra. I was also playing with a band called Miami Horror and I still play with them on occasion to this day. Now, to get sponsored, you've got to have something to offer them. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, people were chasing sponsorships all day, every day on Instagram and all that sort of stuff and it's just like, what does it serve? You know, why? You know, what, what do you need it for? Do you want to be bound to one brand just because it sounds cool? When I was younger, it did sound cool, but I was actually a touring drummer. So yep. if you're the point of being sponsored is that you get to a venue and there's a pearl kit to your specs waiting for you yeah. or a sonar kit or whatever, whatever yep. brand that you're, you know, it's, it's a relationship where they'll look after you because you're ripping their brand with an artist that does well and gets seen by a lot of people, you mm. know. So Australian Music Supplies, they bring in um, pearl as well. And I'd always played Pearl prior to Sonor. And yeah, and I've been with Pearl ever since, officially. Yep. And they've been great. So I was actually fully endorsed before I started doing all the social media stuff, which is, you know, the last couple of years and all of that. Yeah. What are you, what are you required to give them in return? I've got a bit of a um, unique relationship with my companies. So mm. because of the way that the Instagram thing's gone, which we haven't even got into yet, they sort of put me as a priority in terms of like getting things and whatnot. So for example, you know, the kid over there's got the New Zildjian dries on it. And when they hit the country, 
I got first dibs. <laughs> and I wasn't even playing with anyone at the time, man. It was purely just because my Instagram was going well. Yeah. And I was I sent to my bro Stevie, who was a very, you know, he's one of my favorite drummers. He's a hard working drummer. And I was just like, man, this is hilarious, eh? Like I'm not even really doing much at the moment, you know, but because the Instagram was going well. And that's basically where I'm going with it. It's like if you're if you're getting them a lot of exposure, you you get priority with that yeah. sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. And they don't have any expectation from me. They don't ask for anything. Um, everything that I've done in terms of my Instagram and stuff um, has just been me just exploring my playing and, and you know using it as an outlet. Mm. I played with Kimber for two and a half years, and at that time I was also playing with Miami Horror. And then I had an opportunity um, presented to me to open up a cafe, and mm. I'd always made coffee as a way to you know means to an end. And so this was a, it was a bit of a crossroads. It was, I was thinking, shit. She was about to do her first uh, three month tour of the US, supporting Foster of the People. And so things were popping off, man. And and I remember just thinking, shit, if I take this gig, if I like if we really go big time, I was already playing with her, but if I start committing to these tours, I won't be able to see my son on a regular basis. Or well, me and my wife were sharing him with, with his mum. And so I just decided to not play with Kimber. I pulled out of that. And that was the hardest musical decision I'd ever made at the time because everything in my body was saying that playing with her was what I had worked towards. Yep. But everything in my body my sensible mind was saying, uh, my, my dad has always talked about foresight, you know, like having good foresight and that kicked in big time and I just knew there was so much more longevity with me setting up a cafe mm. and being a bit more grounded. And so I set up the cafe and started doing that and then we'd just see the, the posts of them playing on Letterman. They did everything, bro. They did Leno. They did yeah. all these great things and and it took a while for me to deal with that, man. Like it, it was like I, I made the decision and, and it was the right decision but it was fucking hard to watch it all, you know. Yeah. I was still only 24 or 25 at the time and I'd been yeah, pursuing yeah, yeah. drums so heavily for so long and then I finally I was there and then I was like, shit, I don't think I should do this. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. And then um, kept doing the cafe thing, did the odd gigs with Miami Horror and then I actually filled back in for Kimbra for two weeks over in the States, which was great. I was like, fill-ins I can do because yep. me buggering off for two weeks, that's manageable, you know, for yep. my, my business, my, my wife and my kids. And so that was really cool because I still got a little bit of a taste of that thing, you know. Um, you know, we toured from Seattle down to LA over two weeks, a bunch of shows, and they were it was a her headline tour, and it was really cool. Um, and then a few other things here and there as well, festival runs with with a few local bands and whatnot. And then I started playing with a girl called Eka Vandal, and she had found me online because I'd done some YouTube videos, a mm. Sugar Medley and a John Theodore Medley. Yeah. And she she had seen those and she was looking for a, a drummer. They were she, she had just been signed and she was doing some cool stuff and I got a phone call from her. I rang her back and I said, send me a demo. I had to listen and I was running a cafe at the time in between businesses and I was like, shit, this stuff's really cool and I played it to my wife and she's like, wow, that stuff's awesome and I was like, yeah, she wants me to play for her and it was once again just the right time. It was mm. like the early days. She hadn't played with a live drummer yet and then spent the next basically 18 months playing with her, heaps of cool shows. We went to Canada, played locally, you know, a few tours with different bands and stuff around the country. Um, got to get a real taste for that tour life again. And then once again, it got to the point where she was just getting too busy. Yeah. And I was like, fuck. Because the same <laughs> thing also happened with Miami Horror where I toured with them for a little bit and then they said, hey man, we're moving to LA. Do you want to come to LA? And yeah. I was like, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. And yeah. so this, it just seemed to be this reoccurring thing, you know. I'm the, I'm the setup guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Need a guy to set your band up, a drummer, I'm your guy. And um, and then after 18 months with Eka, I pulled the plug on that, which was about, it was two years ago actually, it was February two years ago. And the reason why I did that was because my daughter, like there were some mornings where um, my wife would have to go to work really early and then I would have to then in turn take Audrey to kindy really early, had a really uh, abnormal time for her when it was still dark to then make it to my flight, to then get to get up to Canberra and do the gig. And one morning she just bawled her eyes out because she just did not understand what was going on. She was like three and I was like, I got on the plane and I was like, oh, this is bullshit. This is not fun. Yeah, yeah. This is not fun for her. She mm -hmm. didn't sign up for this, you yeah. know, and now I'm away for two days and it's great. You know, I get to do a gig or whatever, but for what? I've done gigs, you yeah. know, and it was just this realization that yeah. I'm missing out on her, you know, and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd missed out on a bit of my boy for that reason. He was a bit older at that point. But, um, yeah, I don't know. She was only three at the time. And so um, I, I stopped touring with Eka and I basically said to everyone, I'm done. I'm out. Leave me alone. 
And so then I just, uh, I was still missing that playing live feeling because mm. um, that's why I play music. Apart from the connection to the drums, I love playing live. You would love playing live. Yeah. You love looking out into the crowd and people are looking and they watch you do something and you're like, yeah, that's right. And, they're, yeah, and, they're, and, and they're you're vibing. feeding off them and, you're, and then all of a sudden you do something that you don't usually do and it's like, this is fucking cool, you know. Yeah. That's why I play music and I was still missing that. And so Instagram was sort of a, a, you know, a thing, like it was sort of kicking off at the time and I just started – filming myself on my phone practice sessions that I was doing because I was filming myself anyway. Mm. I, I realized I had pretty bad time, like pretty bad pocket. I would listen to myself play and I'd cringe, like actually cringe. I'd hear myself play pocket and I'd go, oh, as opposed to someone like, when you hear someone like Carter Beaufort or Chris Dave or, you know, anyone that with really good pocket, you feel it. Yeah. Eric Moore, you feel it in your chest, like mm. right in the middle. And I wasn't feeling it and I was like, oh man. So I started filming myself and critiquing myself and then parts that I liked, I'd put up on Instagram and then that took off in the space of like, I don't know, it was, it was about a year. I went from, I don't know, like 2,000 followers to like 120,000 followers. Man. It went nuts, man. It's a lot of drummers. Yeah, it is a lot of drummers. But a lot of them weren't drummers too because like I, I had a lot of um, – there were, there were three aspects to the Instagram that sort of evolved over the time. At first it was just me chopping out, so just mm. doing busy stuff and mm. a, lot, a lot of foot technique stuff. And then my companies that I was with, Pearl, Zildjian, and Remo, and they would then reshare my videos on their social medias who had like hundreds sure, of thousands sure, of followers. Yeah. And bro, like the first time that happened when Pearl shared one of my videos, it's just a real averagely shot video of my phone sitting on a milk crate watching me do something, yep. you know, whatever it is. They shared it. I think I got like 4,000 followers from that wow. repost. And it happened in like... And I just thought I was the bee's knees, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, my phone was constantly making noises and dings and all that. And I was like, this is amazing. And then it just kept going and it got busier and busier and busier, which created more of a momentum for me. So what I was missing from playing live, I was now starting to get through the social media. I was mm. getting feedback. Yeah. I was getting that interaction, sure, man, you sure. know. And yeah. so it got really addictive again. Yep. And I just got into a rhythm of it. So I'm very good at setting up a routine and, you know, and sticking to my, to my routine. And that's sort of my happy place when I'm quite structured. Mm. And so I just got into posting uh, most days. Um, and usually when I posted, I would also talk about my state of mind at that time. I'd, I'd blog about, you know, the things that were on my mind, things I like about my drumming, things I don't like about my drumming. I'd never get personal about the scene or the industry, or anything like that. But I was just pretty upfront about what, what I liked and what I disliked in terms of my stuff. And then people started to resonate with the blogging aspect of it. Mm. And then the drumming came almost secondary in terms of what I was posting. I really just enjoyed, I'd get up at five, I'd re-look over the footage that I might have jammed, uh, recorded from a 20-minute jam before I went home the night before. Yep. While I was working out, I'd just skim through it yeah. in between sets, choose a minute that looked half decent, that there weren't too many fuck-ups because yep. it's just me practicing. Yep. you know. And then I'd post it. And then I would like sometimes not even talk about what I was playing. I would just say something that was on my mind about something. And then it was kind of like um, doing a diary or a journal, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, once the Instagram took off, my companies were even more so supportive of, of what I was doing. And mm. they'll send me gear and, and kits and stuff. And some of it's just a long-term loan. Some of it's free. Uh, it's a pretty good arrangement, man. Awesome. You know, so, um, you know, Zildjian sticks as well. So... Um, they just sent me a box of of bricks and yeah yeah and it's so funny when you think about it. Ironically, I'm doing less than I've ever done in my musical life. Yeah, but I'm getting looked after more yeah, than yeah, I could yeah. ever possibly dream. Yeah, and yeah. you're just you're a drummer. Yeah, I'm just a drummer. I don't play with music. Yeah, you're not playing on my Instagram, in a band, no. and you're not touring in a band or promoting music or anything like that. No, you're just playing the drums. It's a weird world, man. The social media side of things is purely part of the journey, but it's not the journey. And I think that's where a lot of people are getting it wrong at the moment. They're treating it like it is the end. Mm. That is, that's the pot of gold. What is the journey leading you towards? What are you, where, well, what are you aiming for? Well, that's a, that's a pretty good question because I've thought a lot about that now. And what I um, reside on is that. I just have to do my part, much like I said to my boy. I just have to show up, man. I just have to keep working at my craft. Yep. The doors will open themselves, man. And they keep on doing that. They keep like, no matter what I do, as long as I keep putting in my time, clocking my hours, you know, logging my hours and showing up and being consistent with trying to get better, that's all I have to do. Whatever presents itself from that point is just going to be a bonus. Mm. I'm, I'm not reliant on my drumming for, for money or financial gain or anything like that because I've got my coffee roastery and things. So, um, which, is a, which for me is a luxury because I don't have to drain that pool on anything else. Yeah. It's purely a creative outlet. Yeah. And it's fucking empowering, man. Like, you know, I'm 33 and I'm still actively 
trying to pursue my craft. Mm. I'm still trying to get better as much as what I was when I was 17. Mm. I think there's a lot said for that. Yeah, there is. You know, I've watched many of my musical peers just fall off completely. Yeah. You know, it just once life kicks in, I've got two kids, I'm married, I, I run a coffee roastery, a wholesale coffee roastery, you know, but I'm still trying to get better on my instrument and I just have to log my hours. So as long as I do that, things will present themselves. Yeah. That's my theory. And if they don't, then... I'm still getting better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited by yeah, how yeah. I'm going to be at 43. Yeah. In 10 more years, man. Yeah. You know, it actually excites me. You can see it in my eyes now. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> can you imagine how good I am? <laughs> no, it's not like that. It's just like, I would just, I just can't wait to, to see what that drummer's doing. Yeah. You know, because I get pretty fixated on different sounds and things. And so who knows what will be, you know, inspiring me then. Mm. And that's all for this week. Thank you so much to Stan Bicknell. Check him out at instagram.com forward slash Stan Bicknell and facebook.com forward slash Stan Bicknell drummer. Stan's choice for artist of the week is Billy Davis. Check out Billy at facebook.com forward slash BLYDVS. Also, while you're on Facebook, make sure to like the Musicians Map Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Musicians Map. This podcast and the website musiciansmap.org is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about community, honesty, and positive progress. The experiences, stories, and advice shared on the podcast are given freely with the hope that you can relate to them and benefit from them. If you've found this podcast enjoyable or useful, make sure to check out the Musicians Map ebook and audiobook about building success in music. You'll find it at musiciansmap.org forward slash books, Amazon, and Audible. And buying a copy of the book directly contributes to the continuation of this podcast. There's also a free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. Go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book to get your copy. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or for the YouTube channel, or you just want to get in touch and say hello, please do so via the Musicians Map Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org. Thanks for listening and stay positive.